Street United Methodist Church. And I hope you are all well. A few things I'd like to go over in our announcements today, and that is that on Wednesdays, hopefully you have been watching the videos that have been coming out by Stephen Ministry. During the month of December, instead of doing one um, longest night service on the 21st of December, it was decided this year not to hold that service, but to do many parts of the service all the way through December to give us that feeling and what, that we really need right now of hope. And then on the 21st, there will be a video that comes out. Please be sure to watch that. They have put a lot of work into that and it is very meaningful. So that's the first thing. The second thing is, jumping ahead to January, because I have to do my advertisement now, we are going to be starting a new series, I have talked about it, called The Story. It is the Bible in 31 weeks. Obviously, it's not in great detail. We're taking a 10,000 look down look, a look down on, the, on God's story and what God has done, is doing, and will do on the earth and in us. So in order to do that, we want you to be prepared. There are books available. If you can pay for them, that is fine. If not, that is fine also. If you can maybe buy two for the price of one, I know that's not good advertisement, but buy two and only take one. Maybe you're buying one for, for um, something else. It's God's economy, not the economy we we'll learn in school. And so uh, the books are right here. Uh, there's an envelope there. Just put the money in the envelope and free, feel free to take the books. There are some children's books there. We're hoping to do a children's series also that follow along. But seeing as Christmas is coming, if you have grandkids, great-grandkids, even children, who would benefit from seeing this God's story in beautiful picture and written form, take a look at those books. Uh, we got some of them in case you would like those. So that's that. Now on to Christmas mission. Just to remind you, we only have one week left to accept um, masks and laundry pods that will be going to all 130 apartments in Tiffin Tower. We are doing gifts for uh, those in Lincoln Park. Um, we still have some tags that we need to be filled and Penny is sitting over here in our cafe area. Um, it looks like a lot of the tags are already going down so be the first in line after the service and come and get those tags. If you are listening on the radio, we welcome you and uh, we'd like to say if you would like to have a tag to uh, purchase gifts, call the office. Peg would be glad, more than glad, to help you out with those. Um, also, uh, cards, Christmas cards, all location cards, those are going to the prison and we would like for you to bring those in uh, so that people in prison can send cards and be in connection with their loved ones. And then finally, our international project. Do you see my friendly cow over here? We have a cow, um, uh, he doesn't have a name because I am not naming him, but this is our cow and we have a thermometer there. Um, in actual fact, the thermometer may not quite be up to date. I have it on good authority that we are this close to purchasing our cow. Isn't that awesome? That is absolutely terrific. Now don't let that be a deterrent for you. I want to move you further and say, if we can buy one, I bet we could buy two. Because one that will be all alone, right? So let us buy that second cow. In this village in Kenya, um, the children are educated in animal um, husbandry. Also, the milk they use feeds those children and gives them good nutritious meals. And um, it, um, then they sell what milk and products are left over to help the welfare of the whole village. That is what one cow can do for a village. Is that not amazing? We just accept it as a cow in a field. But no, this is livelihood and sustainability for those people in the village in Kenya. So uh, I asked Peg to lay out some items here so that we could pray over them today. So won't you join me? Oh Lord, we lift up 
these missions, these outreach that we have chosen for this Christmas. Lord, we don't really know what it is to give sacrificiously, sacrificially, because we give out of our abundance with all that you have given to us. So Lord, bless these things. Bless the people who will receive them. Let your love, your hope, your grace touch each and every one as they receive these things. And Lord, we give you all the grace, all the power, all the thanks. In your wonderful name we pray. Amen. One final thing before we uh, actually begin what we've come here to do, which is to worship God. And that is that uh, I hope you all received the email that came out. Um, the leadership team and I made the decision um, to continue church in, in person worship. But as we do that, and we understand there's many more people who are worshiping at home, either through the radio, listening through the radio, or watching online. But we want to make sure that we are following the protocol that we have set up. So, just to go over that, when you come in, you have your temperature taken and you write your name down so that we can do any community um, logging that we need to. Also, um, if you're obviously sitting in the right pews, we're spread out. Please keep your masks on at all times. And um, uh, then when you leave, wait for the usher to dismiss your uh, pew. And uh, please don't congregate over here. You know, I've been here a few months now. And there's so many people I don't yet know or really had any interaction with. And what I want to do is to come and give you all one great big hug and say, let's sit down and have a conversation. But we can't do that right but the time will come and we can enjoy that. So let's make sure that we're continuing to uh, follow protocol so that we can remain open. Good deal? All right, now let's do what we've really come here to do and open up our uh, worship as we begin with the lighting of the Advent candles.
And now you may join us singing with your mask on or just saying the words in your head or humming along to O Come, O Come, Emmanuel. Let us stand.
us today are given by Penny Blankenship in honor of her son Joe's birthday and by family and friends of MJ, who's sitting right over there, in celebration of her 40th, shh, didn't say that out loud, birthday, wishing you a great day. So celebrations to all of those people. And our radio broadcast today is aired in honor of all our frontline workers. In other um, prayers, needs, please remember Joe Ziegler, who has been uh, suffering from migraines and also is having a hard time with his uh, breathing. So please just remember him. I talked with him on the phone and he's just kind of in misery and he wants to be here. He's so lonely. So if you just lift up some prayers and if you think about dropping him a card, please do. Please remember those who are grieving loss of family. Bonnie Adams, as uh, she is uh, mourning the loss of Gerald, and also Cassie McHenry, who lost her grandmother this week. Let us go to the Lord in prayer. O Lord, our God, we kneel before you at this time. Lord, we need you. 2,000 years ago, you were born as a baby. Emmanuel, come to be with us. Lord, you have remained with us. But during Advent, we have the opportunity to remember that all over again. The fact that you loved us so much, you were willing to come down here to be one of us and be with us. Lord, we need you. Just like in the Christmas carol, Scrooge finally realizes that he needs you and he's redeemed. So, Lord, we need redemption. Help us turn away from our wickedness, our sinfulness, and live lives full of you as we pass that on to others. Lord, we look for hope. We need hope. Be with all of those who are working in hospitals, in schools, in stores, where there are many people. Keep us all safe and protected, Lord. And be with all those who are mourning the loss of loved ones, recently and at this time of the year. Now, Lord, we turn to you to lift up that prayer that you taught us and together we say as a community, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. And now please enjoy our song, Waiting, by Deborah Morgan, Kathy Seymour, Rob Motes, and Al Hager. Thank you. 
Please stand as we read our scripture today, which comes from Matthew's Gospel, chapter 1, verses 18 through 25. This is how the birth of Jesus the Messiah came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph, but before they came together, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law, and yet did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit, she will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him, and took Mary home as his wife. But he did not consummate his marriage until she gave birth to a son, and he gave him the name Jesus. This is God's word for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. Let us pray. O oh Lord, as we settle for a few moments to think about this scripture and to hear a little bit more about the story in Christmas Carol, let us, like Scrooge, find hope and hold on to that hope this week, the hope we need and the hope we need to give to others. In your name we pray. Remembering Christmas past. I want to take you down memory lane. Now for some of us, the lane is a little longer than others as we stretch back to our childhood. That's all I'm saying. But I want to take you to mine. And you think about your childhood experience of Christmas. For me, the night before Christmas Eve, my bed would be dismantled and moved into my brother's room. I had to share a room with my brothers only for two nights because my grandparents were coming and they were staying. So that was okay. 
We had a tradition in our household that we put pillowcases out at the end of our beds. We didn't hang stockings. We had pillowcases. I guess our Santa was more generous. Anyway, we put these pillowcases at the end of our beds and every year without fail, we would wake up Christmas morning and they would be packed full of gifts. And my brothers and I would tear into them and start reading the books and playing with the toys that were there. <coughs> Excuse me. You know, later on in adulthood, I realized how smart my parents were. That bought them an extra hour's rest in bed. We would wander downstairs, and the day before, we'd set up a live tree. Sorry, I thought I had to sneeze. But we didn't turn the lights on. It was decorated, but no lights were turned on on Christmas Eve. We would come down Christmas morning, and the lights on the tree would be glistening. There would be more gifts that had appeared underneath the tree since we'd gone to bed. We'd come home from midnight mass, and we'd set up our nativity set, because my mom never got it out till Christmas Eve. And on Christmas Eve, Jesus was not in the manger. It wasn't until we got up Christmas morning, and we looked, I would always run over and look, and there was the little baby Jesus in the manger. Our family would come over, and we'd have a huge Christmas dinner. We would bring in all the tables that we had from different rooms to make one really long table that would fit from corner to corner in our living room. And I had the job of setting the table. Because you see, no one else could do it quite like I did. <laughs> Everything had to be perfect. The knives and the forks just right, the placemats in place. The glasses shining. And then I would carry the food in and put it on the table when everything was ready. We came in. What a sight that was. What a beautiful table. And the smell all through the day. Oh, I can imagine it now. We would sit down and my dad would open up the meal with a prayer. What well, Christmas childhood memories have gone through your mind as I've been telling mine. You see, Christmas was perfect. It was full of peace and harmony, right? It isn't until we get a little bit older, and it isn't until we stop and really look back that we realize that this perfection and this total peace and total harmony that we imagine Christmas to be is not reality. In fact, our gospel accounts are not accurate. Now before you shoot me, let me explain that. If you turn to Mark's gospel, Mark begins the story of Jesus with his baptism by John the Baptist. No birth story in there at all. It's a good job we don't rely just on Mark's gospel at Christmas, isn't it? Then you turn to John, and John describes Jesus as the Word. The Word come down. There's no angels, there's no manger, there's no Mary, no Joseph in Luke's story of the birth. In John's story, sorry. In Luke's story, which is the one we know the best, and we hear at Christmas, it includes other parts of the story as well. Matthew's story that we heard today is from Joseph's perspective. The nativity story we know the best is a mixture of all those stories and then some. Tradition 
that we want to hold on to. And we're not even sure if it's true. Our memories of the past and even in the gospel stories, we tell them the way that we think they should have been. We sing silent night, holy night, time out. There was nothing holy or silent about a birth in a stable. Have you ever been in a stable? It stinks. That, to me, isn't holy. And silent? There were animals there. Animals aren't silent, even when they sleep. But we have this image of a holy, saintly evening. But if we think about it, it wasn't true, right? Mary, a scared, young teenager, suddenly finding herself pregnant. Was she abandoned by her family? Joseph, engaged to be married to her, struggling with the fact that his fiancée is pregnant and it wasn't him. He did at least have the decency not to want to disgrace her publicly. He was going to divorce her until an angel appeared to him. Does his family think he was crazy? And if that wasn't enough, the government decided to hold a census and send everyone to the original town of their birth. So they had to travel to Bethlehem with Mary in eight months pregnant. And there was no room for them. Was it that no one wanted to take in that young couple, or was there really literally no room? If Joseph's family was from Bethlehem, why didn't they take them in? I have so many questions. They give him a stable, and in that stable, alone, cold, frightened, they give birth to the Son of God. It's not perfect, but really, it's our own reality. Scrooge says to Fred, his nephew, in A Christmas Carol, you keep Christmas in your own way and let me keep it in mine. Scrooge wants nothing to do with the real story of Christmas. He wants to keep himself to himself and live his lonely life. And suddenly, a spirit appears and takes him back in his life. And Scrooge discovers, by the way, who watched A Christmas Carol this week or read the book? Did anybody watch it? Oh, you're lacking, you're lacking. Okay, this week, watch the story because it's going to make a lot more sense. Dana, thank you so much for watching that. Thank you. You're my hope today. <laughs> but Scrooge is taken back in time. And he realizes that what he thought about Christmas, he had actually forgotten his own story. He'd forgotten how lonely he was as a child, how distant his family was, that he was made fun of and not included by friends. Suddenly he remembers that he was all alone. And then he makes a discovery. Our past shapes who we choose to become in the world. Our past shapes who we choose to become in the world. Things happen to us that we have no control over, but we have a choice to allow those things to form us into a better person, or like Scrooge, shove them down and close ourselves off to the world 
and live as misers, only living for ourselves. Scrooge hides behind the reality and chooses not to become the person that he could. He chooses money. Now, none of us is perfect, but I will tell you this this morning. Each one of us are made perfectly to follow Christ. But what that takes is surrender on our own part. Surrender of the control of our lives and willingness to enter into the transformed life that Jesus offers us by him becoming human, by becoming Emmanuel, God with us. The next thing that happens to Scrooge is that suddenly he finds himself at the house of Mr. and Mrs. Fezziwig. I love that name. I don't know where Dickens came up with it. I've actually never met a Fezziwig, but I wish I had. Mr. and Mrs. Fezziwig. And as he's looking through the window, he sees himself. He was Fezziwig's apprentice. And he has this huge party <coughs> at which, to which he invites his family, his friends, <coughs> and all his employees. Excuse me, Robert. <coughs> and they're all having such a great time. Scrooge remembers these times of music and dancing and fellowship. You know, music often helps us move through our emotions and our feelings. If you had a choice, would you play Christmas music all year round? I have a rule in my house, no music until after Thanksgiving, and then it plays right up until January the 6th, Epiphany, and then it's off. But I long to hear Christmas music. Why? Because it brings us joy and hope and love. As Scrooge is watching all of this partying going on, he gets caught up in the music. And for the first time in the story, we see him dancing to the music and we see a little bit of happiness and he remembers how happy he was at those events. In fact, he realizes that Fezziwig had provided him with happiness over money because instead of getting a Christmas bonus, Fezziwig has put their profits into putting on this party for everyone. And Scrooge realizes that it's the togetherness, it's the hope, it's the fellowship that he is now longing for. He has given up on the happiness and chosen money. It is the first time that Scrooge realizes maybe there is hope. I had to put it up. Scrooge has The color for this week that represents hope is green. Why green? Everywhere you look in Christmas decorations, there's green. Green for the evergreen, green for nature, green that shows us that evergreens will forever be green. It's the hope that spring will come. It's the hope that their good times are just around the corner. And friends, do we need that to hear that today? There is hope that one day we will be able to sit down at a table without masks and have conversation, have meals together, and for me to really get to know you like I long for. Green. 
It's a, it's a symbol of hope and redemption. And in remembering that party scene, Scrooge sees hope. But before he can enjoy it too much, the spirit takes him back to his bedroom, where he's all alone, it's the middle of the night. He returns to the reality of his life as he has made it. All hope is gone. He has placed his hope in money and things, not relationships, not giving to others, not sharing with others. Do you know people like that? Is there maybe a part of that in each of us? It's why we do mission, especially at Christmas, to remember who we were created to be. We get so busy around the Christmas season, we get overly tired, stressed out, we have a bad attitude, we get moody, and we're unhappy, and sometimes we'll say, I can't wait for Christmas to be over. Ever done that? We get impatient and unkind because we are simply too busy. You ever ask yourself why you get so busy? Maybe it's to avoid what's bubbling up inside of us. Here's what the author of the book um, the Redemption of Scrooge wrote. Think about it. If we were not so busy, brothers and sisters would have to play with each other. Husbands and wives would have to talk. Families would have to sit around the table and talk about their day. And when the distractions are gone, we are forced to be vulnerable. For many people, Christmas is not a happy time. We remember loved ones that we miss. Maybe there's an event that happened that prevents us from totally being happy and we think we should be happy at Christmas. But Christmas is about facing reality and being honest with ourselves. We had a neighbor for years we got very, very close to. He'd been single for years, and when he was 50, he got married. Right before that time, one Christmas afternoon, I was not pastoring, but my husband was. We got a call, and our next door neighbor, Mo, said, Tim, will you come? Dad lay down to take a nap, and he's not moving. He died. Christmas afternoon. Twelve years later, within a few hours of the exact time, his mother passed away on Christmas Day also. For him, Christmas changed. He could have been very bitter about it, right? But he chose to celebrate family. That's what Christmas is really about. God became vulnerable. He entrusted his own son to human care. Christ became one of us, human, vulnerable, even broken because he knew what we would go through. Can you imagine Jesus in heaven? Glorious heaven. And the Father came up with the idea that he was going to come down to earth and put all heaven aside and become You know why he did that? Because he loves us that much. 
Maybe Scrooge's inability to be merry was a way of honoring his own heartbreak. He chose to remember the pain and the brokenness and he shut himself away and shut others out. But when Christ came to earth, he showed us that we are to share our pain and suffering with others. Jesus left his brokenness in the tomb and he chose to continue sharing his life with his friends and with us. And friends, that is what we're to do. So when we get caught up in all the activities of Christmas, all the things that we have to do, we become like Scrooge. So this week, I'd like to put out a challenge to you. I want you to stop just for a short time each day. Allow your memory to go into the past and come up with a memory. It might be a happy one. It might not be happy. But it is all part of the Christmas story. And then allow the tension of the happiness and the unhappiness, of the chaos that's going on right now, and sit with it for a few moments and then give it to Jesus. He came for you not to be unhappy but to be able to make it through life and carry the candle of hope not only for yourself but for all we meet. Let's pray. Lord, we need hope today. We need hope right now. And the only person who can provide that for us is you. There is hope. Because you came to be with us. You died for us. You rose for us. And you are leading the way to everlasting life and, more importantly, to a renewed Christmas when you will come again. Lord, we look forward with hope to that time. In the meantime, we can live in your kingdom now. Give us peace. Give us hope that we can pass on to others. Amen. If you would take out your communion, if you have that. When Jesus was sitting around the table with his disciples at the Last Supper, he took the bread He blessed it and he said, this is my body, broken for you. When you come together, take it, eat it, and remember me. And then he took the cup and he asked for a blessing from his Father above. And he said, this is my blood. Shed for the forgiveness of sins and for the hope of resurrection. Friends, this is the symbol of hope we have week to week and we can take with us every day. Let us pray. Lord, send down your Holy Spirit upon this bread and this cup. Transform it, Lord, into your body, your blood, and as we take, let it be transformed inside of us so that we can live in and through you and take you out into a world that needs you. We ask all this in your wonderful name. Amen. Friends, take, eat, and drink.
was Al Hager singing Child of Hope. Wasn't that just beautiful? Take that with you today. Last week, it was peace. This week, it's hope. There is hope in the world, in Jesus Christ. Let us pray. Lord, as we go forth from this place, we have been filled with hope, your hope. Let us take that, not only for ourselves, but let us share it, because that's what hope is. Lord, get us through this difficult time right now. And let us stand on the foundation you gave us of hope. And never let go. We ask this in the name of God the Father, through his Son, Jesus Christ. And in the power of the Holy Spirit, all God's people say, Amen. Amen.